Spawn of the Ruins by Mark Laidlaw. That's me. I was disturbed from my leisurely pursuit of Leandro's The Abstractions and Essence of Kofer's Basaltic Culture as Related to Quantum Mechanics by the irritating jangle of my telephone. Setting that exquisitely rare and absorbing tome aside, I reached for the phone with one hand while relighting my pipe with the other. Not an easy thing to do, I assure you, as I have very often severely singed my mustache and caused the skin of my face great pain in so doing. I was not at all displeased to discover that the caller was one Miss Avender, a charming young lady who dwelled alone, and vulnerably, I might add, in a small house a short distance down the avenue from my own. I was somewhat more than acquainted with Miss Avender, as in the past we had spent the long evenings in fascinating and intellectually stimulating conversations, and as these visits had been conducted in both of our homes, I was well familiar with her location. Ah, Miss Avender, I enthused, letting the warmth I felt blend with the fine natural resonance of my voice. It is indeed enchanting to hear your lovely voice, for indeed it remains lovely even through this awful electrical convenience, the telephone. You are too kind, Mr. Leandro, to a poor lonely maid such as myself, Miss Avender argued. Why, how lucky I am to have one such as yourself for a neighbor. Indeed, and how lucky am I. But, Mr. Leandro, I call to beg from you a favor. Ah, and what might this favor be, madam? Oh, in truth, it is no more than an overloaded fuse. The poor thing was simply not strong enough to bear the energy being used by my many electrical appliances, so it burnt out, and I have been plunged into the utter eternal darkness of this place. Miss Avender, you have a delightful way with words. Yes, as you yourself have on occasion noted. But what of the tragically burnt out fuse? Have you a spare? <clears throat> Indeed, yes, I believe I have, Miss Avender, and I shall be entirely delighted to deliver it in person to your very door. You are a kind soul, Mr. Leandro. Thank you, Miss Avender. I think I shall now pursue that half-fabled box of fuses which I know lurks somewhere within my house, most probably within a kitchen drawer. Now, I shall bid you adieu, but soon to appear at my door, of course? Of course. Adieu, then, Monsieur Leandro. Madam, I firmly but gently reprimanded, I am not a Frenchman. When I had finally uncovered the rumored fuses, buried beneath a clutter of unused tacks and rubber bands, I packed them safely into my pocket, where they thumped reassuringly in that reassuring way in which fuses thump. As I was merely out for a short jaunt through the darkness of the ruins, I did not tidy myself up in any great manner, but as I expected to be later entertained by Miss Avender, at the completion of my task, of course, I did give my hair a swift combing through and apply a bit of my best cologne to certain strategically located areas of my enviable physique. Though I had heard rumors that it was the time of spawning in the ruins again, I did not bother to arm myself with anything more than a letter opener, the same which had been given to me by Miss Avender only a few months before. Though there were possible dangers of being confronted in the ruins by maniacal rogue jodes or limpospofe in their mating frenzies, it is generally considered against gentlemanly principles, and one must always concern oneself with principles, to venture even to dangerous areas armed with anything other than a sharp object which had been the gift of a lady. Pistols at night cannot even be discussed under such circumstances. Flashlights, too, I find ungentlemanly. So instead I placed a lit candle into an ornate metal holder and used this as my guiding light. The ruins, which lie at the utmost bottom of the subterranean chasms, have probably never experienced a draft of any natural kind in all their uncounted eons of existence, and so I feared not that the candle might be extinguished by a gust of wind while I ventured to Miss Avender's house. And, so equipped, I stepped out into the fathomless dark and traced my way down the avenue. My house was built precisely at the edge of the ruins, but Miss Avender's place of residence had been erected in the midst of the ruins themselves. Thus I set out along that antique avenue, through the unimaginable blacknesses of the subterranean world, with but a single candle to light my way. I wondered if I would go mad should my candle blow out, as so many others had done in these depths, and to my dismay I then discovered that I had neglected to bring a single match with me. However, I resolved not to let this hinder me, and I continued without a thought to my personal safety, 
knowing that Miss Avender sat patiently awaiting me within the ruins, her home plunged momentarily into darkness. How brave she had sounded on the phone. Certainly I could strive to be half as brave as to walk a short distance without a spare match. And now the ruins rose above the ancient avenue and disappeared into the darkness overhead that the candle's feeble light could not illuminate. They were like row upon row of black, dingy storefronts leering over the avenue with empty, yawning windows. The avenue, I noted, seemed much reduced in size when compared to those prehistoric ruins. But I proceeded undaunted past those eternally dismal ruins, being sure not to quicken my step, and came at last to the more ruinous ruins. Those were jagged pillars, teeth if you will, that were the remnants of structures more ancient than those of the blocky buildings. They sprang from the ground at irregular but frequent intervals, and the flickering candlelight caused them to leap and caper annoyingly. Soon, I knew, I would come to Miss Avender's house, but first, as you shall see, I was to have a not entirely pleasant adventure. For as I walked through the more disordered ruins, I looked above and within them, and thus did not see that which caused me to stumble a moment later, almost extinguishing my candle. I set my candle upon the ground and turned to examine the obstacle in the avenue. It was a human body, bent at awkward angles and unpleasantly mangled beyond recognition. Dressed as it was in a white uniform with black stripes, now dreadfully stained and discolored, which I recognized as the uniform of a newspaper boy. Indeed, as I looked closer, I found that the body was sprawled atop the bag of the carrier. Within this bag I found a single newspaper, mine, as I was the last customer on the boy's route, bearing the blatant headline, Spawning Season Begins. It was all very tragic, for the poor boy had died recently, judging from the date on the paper, and delivering my newspaper. Perhaps if I had cancelled my subscription, this might never have occurred, for I rarely read the newspaper and almost never even check to see if it had been delivered. But then things are always much simpler in retrospect. As I rose from the awful lich, I noted the six-taloned claw marks on its arm and realized the full unpleasantness of the situation. The boy had obviously been killed by a jode in its mating frenzy. He should have paid closer attention to the headlines he carried, for all parts of the chasms, though particularly the ruins, are exceedingly dangerous during the time of spawning, and that latter thought brought me to immediate alertness, aware instantaneously of my surroundings. There was a low hooting in the ruins before me, and I recognized that hooting as the mating call of the Limpospofa. Instantly my letter opener was in my hand, and I shivered as the hoot was answered from behind me with the high-pitched Dali, Dali of the courting Jode. With my admirable presence of mind, I turned parallel to the avenue so that I could watch the ruins on either side. Shadows moved within, approaching the avenue, and simultaneously me. To my left, there was a final shriek of Dali, and a huge swollen Jode jumped onto the avenue beside me. Thankfully, it didn't see me immediately, as it was looking for its mate, the Limpospofa. And a moment later, that infamous creature too lumbered heavily onto the path beside me, hooting through the single orifice in its tiny, bulbous head. However, with the arrival of the Limpospofa, my presence could no longer remain a secret. This creature spotted me immediately and gave an inquiring hoot in my direction, thereby pointing me out to the Jode, who seemed rather disturbed that I should be observing this annual ritual. Thinking of poor Miss Avender, desperately waiting for my fuses, I slashed out with the letter opener and thus removed the Limpospofa's tiny head from its gelatinous shoulders. The poor creature staggered backward into the ruins, spouting a pale ichor that was not exceedingly pleasant to the nose. Its enraged mate, the Jode, now leaped at me so that I was forced to deliver a rather cunningly placed fatal stab to its tentacular mass. It, too, fell shrieking into the ruins, and in the distance I could now hear other things coming to investigate. Thinking it wise to bring Miss Avender her fuses as swiftly as possible, I grabbed up my candle, smoothed down my hair, and dashed down the impossibly ancient avenue in the direction of that fair lady's home. Now, imagine my genuine surprise when approaching Miss Avender's tiny cottage, I discovered bright lights pouring brightly forth from all her windows, and even a porch light burning cheerily above her red door. I rang the doorbell, thinking it very peculiar that there should be electric bulbs glowing when the fuse had burnt out. The door at last opened wide, revealing a very lovely Miss Avender dressed in a beautiful blue gown. 
Needless to say, there were electric lights burning within the house, too. And here I must make a very unpleasant statement, for it appears I have most scandalously lied to you. Miss Avender had not really burnt out a fuse, and I, you see, had not truly believed her story quite as much as I had hinted earlier. Indeed, I had not even brought fuses with me, for the thumping box in my pocket turned out to contain chocolate bonbons, and these I duly presented to Miss Avender. "'Ah, oh, Mr. Leandro,' she smiled. "'Do come in. Did you have a pleasant journey through the ruins?' "'Thank you, Miss Avender. As a matter of fact, my journey was very unsettling, for I discovered the corpse of a paper carrier, and have aggravated the spawning hordes without. Even now, I fear, they march upon your home, hoping to destroy us both.' "'Oh, do sit down, Mr. Leandro. What an awful tale. Care for a mint? And what do you suggest we do?' "'Thank you. I suggest that we flee from here immediately and return to my house, where I am properly prepared for such an attack. Unless, of course, you happen to have a cache of weapons hidden somewhere.' Here, let me help you loosen your coat. No, I fear I have no weapons aside from the letter opener you gave me last year. But will you not stay? Well, uh, now that you bring it up, perhaps I could do with a short rest. We can certainly leave in a few moments, just as easily. I'm glad that you see it in such a manner, Mr. Leandro. Yes, I believe a few moments will not hurt Miss... Miss... Avender. But then... Just as we had begun an evening of fascinating, intelligent discussion, Miss Avender's front door, the bright red one, you may recall, splintered into pieces. A six-taloned claw smashed through without any regard to the high cost of finely crafted doors, and withdrew again. Well, said I, perhaps we would be just as well off to depart immediately, Miss Avender. Have you a fresh candle? I'm sorry, Miss Avender admitted. I have not but a flashlight. Well, all right, but you must carry it. And now, out the back exit. We hurried through Miss Avender's home, and she opened wide that narrow door in her kitchen, which led by means of a secret tunnel through some of the ruins and onto the avenue a short distance from Miss Avender's house. For various reasons, this exit had proved indispensable on certain occasions when Miss Avender had still been Mrs. Avender. We emerged minutes later onto the avenue to see a mob of hooting limpospophi and shrieking jodes overwhelming Miss Avender's tiny home. To our dismay, we were spotted immediately by one member of the crowd who hooted and drew us to the attention of the others. Now, Miss Avender, I recommended, we must run and don't trip on the newspaper carrier. We dashed off down the avenue, while behind us the actions of the spawning things were rechanneled to pursuing us. In a few minutes we came to the blocky younger ruins, and though we ran through these as quickly as we could, the sounds of pursuit grew ever louder behind us. Moments later, we were out of the ruins, and I saw in the distance the lights of my house. We raced up the walkway, flung open the front door, and locked ourselves within. I went immediately to a panel set in the wall beside the door and flipped on all the outside floodlights, as the Jodes and Limpospophi dislike light of any sort. Through the window, I saw figures gathering in the shadows. Hoots and cries of Dali! Dali! came repeatedly to my ears. The lights wouldn't hold them off for very much longer, and now only my ingenuity and preparation would save us. I found another button-dotted panel hidden behind one of my more sensitive Leandro originals, and this proved the key to our salvation. Miss Avender, I said, what I might do is a very ungentlemanly thing, and utterly immoral besides. So I would appreciate it if you would press these buttons in my stead. Miss Avender graciously acquiesced, and placed her dainty finger one by one on each of the buttons, and pushed them. And one by one, coincident with the pressing of the respective buttons, there were unpleasant explosions outside in the shadows all around my house. These were followed by utterly awful thumps on the roof as the hordes without were demolished by my carefully placed explosives and flung every which way. It took us three days to clean up the resultant widespread mess. As Miss Avender's house had been destroyed by the enraged beasts, she remained as a guest in my house, and thus was able to assist with repairs as well as provide engaging conversation. We have not since been bothered by jodes or limpospophi, and you people inform me that this is because both of these rare species are now extinct. Certainly I could not have foreseen that during that particular part of the season the mass migration that you call the influx had begun, thus bringing all members of both species into the ruins. And I certainly could not have guessed that they would all attack my home simultaneously, and hence be destroyed by my defenses. 
Yes, I am sorry they are extinct, for such an occurrence is always a tragic thing. But how can you blame me for their extinction? After all, it was Miss Avender who pushed the buttons. The End